Hi there, good, good evening for all of you. We are coming to the, our last webinar of the day of the third day of Cambridge Day 2020. How are you guys? Before I introduce our next speaker, the traditional big up. Big up for people who are in Venezuela with us, Sete Lagoas, Minas Gerais, Florianópolis, Oran, Salta, Azul, Misiones, Todas, and Argentina. Apogee, the city of Apogee in Brazil, big up for you too. Copiapo in Chile, Osorno in Chile, Colombia, Cajobi, São Paulo, Juazeiro, the whole ELT community together for the Cambridge Day 2020. We reached, we reached the middle of our five day uh, event and now we have our last speaker and he's coming. He kinds actually, he's born and in a tiny jewel called Uruguay which is a country known for its political history, its landscape where the wild can be a few meters away from the paradors and the casinos. And now you probably figure it out that a place I dream to go. Our next speaker lives there and he is the president of the International Association of English Teachers as a Foreign Language. He's a doctor and a master in education and applies the lessons learned for, from the classroom to his whole as a teacher of teachers, researcher, writer, and consultant. Please welcome Gabriel Diaz Maggioli. Hi, it's everybody. Our... Hi, Gabriel. It's Hello, your... Renata. Tudo bem? Tudo bem, querido. <laughs> it's Maggioli, like Italian? Maggioli, yeah, Italia, oh, Italia. Yeah. It's a multicultural world, the one we are Absolutely. living in. So glad to have you here. And, so wanted uh, to be here. So please, uh, I think that everybody is ready and anxious for your webinar. And after that, I return to have the Q&A session and to have Wonderful. your last word with us. Okay, thank you. Have fun. Thank you. And hello, everybody, from a tiny little jewel within the jewel that Arenata mentioned. I'm coming live from a small seaside town called Parque del Plata. 50 kilometers from the capital city in a very gloomy, dark, gray day with no rain, but it's coming. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me uh, tell you what we are going to be doing. The topic I chose for today's session is professional development in times of lockdown. A lot has been said about what is going on and I'm going to be talking about a uh, perspective on professional development, which um, is a topic very dear to me. I've been researching and writing on professional development for the past 25 years. And the reason of my interest in professional development is, I'm going to say from the very beginning, it is my belief that the power of teaching lies on the teacher and not on the experts that influence teaching. I think that teachers' voices have been silenced for far too long, and we need to make those voices heard. So what we're going to be doing today, talking about professional development and reflecting a little bit about our reality nowadays, is the following. We're going to start with a story. I love stories because stories inspire us, and stories give us food for thought, and stories are very... Um, integral to the human experience. Then from that story, what we're going to do is consider what CPD is. What is CPD? Continuous, continuous professional development or continued professional development, whatever you want to say. We're going to try and understand what it is. And then can COVID-19. And we're going to see how that definition plays out in your daily lives and this new normal <laughs> that we are being exposed to how it has impacted the profession but more importantly what can we learn from it so i'm going to give you a test and it's a yes no question test nobody's going to see the answer so don't worry and then we're going to look at what we know about effective cpd Right. There's been a lot of research, not only in English language teaching, but also in 
teaching in general. And my perspective is that unfortunately, we have all this information, but it is not being applied, particularly in these very sensitive times. So I'm going to try and advance an agenda for the future. I'm going to try to do a little bit of futurology, if you wish, and give you a few pointers, a few ideas. And because it's always nice, we're going to finish with a story as well. So here we are. We're going to talk about this very traditional story. Some of you may know it. It's called Stone Soup. As I tell you the story, please just think about how this story makes you feel at this time and age in history. It goes on like this. Once upon a time, there was a kindly old stranger walking through the land. One day, he came upon a small village, and as he entered, the villagers moved towards their homes, locking doors and windows. Sounds familiar? The stranger smiled and asked, why, you all, why are you all so frightened? I'm a simple traveler looking for a soft place to stay for the night and a warm place for a meal. And the villagers responded, there's not a bite to eat in the whole province. We are weak and our children are starving. Keep moving on. Don't stay here. But the traveler said, oh, don't worry. I have everything I need. In fact, he said, I was just thinking of making some stone soup to share with all of you. He pulled on an iron cauldron from his cart, filled it with water, and began to build a fire under it. Then with great ceremony. He drew an ordinary looking stone from a silken bag and dropped it into the water. By now, hearing the rumor of food, most of the villagers had come out of their homes or watched from their windows. As the stranger sniffed the broth, he licked his lips in anticipation, and hunger began to overcome their fear. Ah, the stranger said to himself rather loudly, I do like a tasty stone soup. Of course, stone soup with cabbage, that's hard to beat. Soon, a villager approached hesitantly, holding a small cabbage he'd retrieved from his hiding place. And he said, here you are, put it in the pot. Wonderful, cried the stranger. You know, I once had stone soup with cabbage and a bit, a bit of salt beef as well, and it was fit for a king. The village but butcher managed to find some salt beef, and so it went into the cauldron with some potatoes that villagers brought, onions brought by other villagers, carrots, mushrooms, and so on, until there was indeed a delicious meal for everyone in the village to share. The next morning, our traveler started packing his things and was ready to leave, to leave when the village elder offered the stranger a great deal of money for the magic stone. But the traveler refused to sell it and started leaving town. Well, if this sounds familiar, I think that it quite likely represents the situation we are all in nowadays, where we are locked down in our house, we are trying to do the best we can for our students with the tools we have at our disposal, right? And as we, we engage in true teaching and learning innovations, we keep hearing here and there that this is the best 
time ever to pursue continued professional development. And honestly, the teachers are engaged in a lot of professional development nowadays. So what is professional development? This is a definition that I wrote for a, a book that is coming up soon. And I define professional development as a career-long process during which teachers hone their teaching knowledge, skills, and dispositions so as to be able to reach more students and help them succeed at learning. Now, I would like to highlight three areas in this definition. The first one is that it is a process. As a process, it is bound to evolve over time and it's characterized by sprints and plateaus. So we advance a lot or we stay stagnant for some time. And of course, it may also include false starts, regressions, as well as progressions. The second part of the definition that I would like to highlight has to do with the honing of knowledge, skills, and dispositions. What do we teachers need to know in order to be able to teach and teach well? Well, we need to know the language. Yeah, that's basic. But we also need to know the methodology. But we also need to know about what and how students learn and how we can promote the best opportunities for students to learn. So the last thing that I would like to uh, highlight here is that the purpose of professional development is to improve the student's learning. Or is it? I wrote this definition before COVID-19, and I'm having second thoughts about it nowadays, if I am to be uh, honest. Because when COVID-19 came, our whole world, world changed. First of all, the clock does not, if you are anything like me and my colleagues around here, the clock does not exist. At this very minute, I'm in my house, in the dining room, and my wife is in the bedroom teaching a class, and one of my sons is in the other bedroom, his bedroom, taking a class from university. So the clock seems to have disappeared. There's no time. We have our cell phones, we have our tablets, and we are surrounded, if we have them, if, and we are surrounded by WhatsApp messages, emails popping up on our screen. So we really don't have uh, any time. But my question is, let's be honest. How can a teacher who's teaching so much, preparing so much, correcting so much, afford the time to engage in professional development? Uh, one thing that has happened, at least in my countries, I have heard a lot of uh, colleagues complain about the pressure they are under, particularly from parents. As a parent myself, I'm outraged at some of the stories that I've heard, where parents say, I want you to teach them on this video conference so software every single day that you were supposed to have a class. And if you say, but we are also using like a learning platform, uh, learning management platform. So whatever we do there is also part of my teaching. And we are using applications with activities, that is also part of the teaching. But the parents don't see it. They just feel if you are not in front of the camera, you are not teaching. And so socially, at least in my country, teachers have come under a lot of criticism. Well, everybody was very happy to go out at 9 p.m. and clap for the health workers who get all my respect and uh, a gratitude for putting themselves in so much risk. Me, my colleagues and I have also been doing a lot of things that we were perhaps not even prepared to do. And we've been doing it really mostly on our own. So that magic stone that made the soup so tasty by bringing others around has not always been with us. Fortunately, there are influential people who really recognize what we do.
And here is a tweet from Shonda Rhimes. I don't know if you know Shonda Rhimes. She's a TV producer of very famous shows like Grey's Anatomy, for example, Scandal, uh, How to Get Away with Murder. She's a really influential people and is followed by many people on, on, uh, on Twitter. And this is what she wrote on March 16th. Been homeschooling a six-year-old and eight-year-old for one hour and 11 minutes. Teachers deserve to make a billion dollars a year or billion dollars a week. So we are, after all, getting some recognition. But we have settled into what people have been calling the new normal. And I say, no, there's nothing normal about this. Normal means I can go out when I feel like I want to go out and take a breath of fresh air. Normal means that I'm teaching here in my home. My wife is teaching in the bedroom. My son is learning in the bedroom. And perhaps we cross each other on our way to the bathroom, but we don't talk to, to one another. So there's nothing normal about this situation we are in. And if your desk looks anything like mine, it's a mess. Now, I used to have a friend, well, I have a friend who used to have this wonderful notice on her desk. The notice read, a clean desk is the sign of a sick mind. I think that I'm going nuts. As you can see on this desk, it's just like yours, right? There's food in it. You sometimes start smelling something and say, where does that smell come from? And then you forgot that under the pile of books that you've been using and materials that you have spread out all, all over the table, you forgot a piece of a sandwich last Friday, and now it's getting rotten and beginning to smell. So again, there's nothing normal about this situation. So before we go any further, I would like to give you a test. This is a test of 10 questions, and I'm going to share the, the uh, let's say, the key, the answers at the end. What I want you to do is, as we go question by question, just think how true they are for yourself, okay? It would be good if you could write down numbers 1 to 10, and then uh, you, what your answer to each of the questions has been. So let's see this. Question number one. Are you sometimes afraid that others will discover how much knowledge or, knowledge or ability you currently really lack? Question number two. Do you hesitate to allow yourself to believe that you are a good online instructor. Question number three. Do you feel that you are currently coping because you happen to be in the right place at the right time and or maybe you knew the right person who could help you? Question number four. Do you feel uneasy and discouraged if your online class is not your best or at least very special? Do you ever compare your ability with that of your colleagues and think that they may be more intelligent or somehow more deserving than you are? Question number six. Are you afraid that your students will find out that you are not as capable as they think you are? And do you often worry about the quality of your online teaching, although your students are learning? If you receive a great deal of praise or recognition for your teaching, like when your students say something at the end of the uh, video conference, like, teacher, best class ever. Do you tend to say, to discount the importance of what you've done? You say, no, no, this is actually because you guys also were there. How about number nine? Are you disappointed with your present teaching accomplishments? I think you should have accomplished much more. 
And last but not all the least, number 10. Do you tend to avoid asking your students to evaluate your teaching? Or maybe dread their answers if the evaluation of your teaching is mandatory? If you have answered yes to at least four of these questions, you are suffering from something which is called imposter syndrome. This new normal has thrown us in at the deep end. And we have had to cope with learning how to manage technology, and more importantly, how to solve the problems that using technology has brought along when your students have no connectivity, for, for example, when you don't have connectivity, when you don't have materials to teach and you have to create them, right? The first tendency that we have is to diminish our worth and our work because we don't feel that competent or that confident. This has certainly happened to me. I'm not teaching English language learners anymore, but I'm teaching future teachers, and I teach the introductory methodology course. And my challenge this year is they are going to be doing teaching practice, not in a classroom, but through the computer. So I have been teaching with technology since 1997. I mean, actually doing distance learning since 1997. And I worked in perhaps one of the most prestigious universities in a program that was ex entirely online. I learned a lot about online teaching, and yet, as a method teacher, I felt I shouldn't be there. And I keep telling my students, like, well, take this with a pinch of salt, because I don't know if this is going to work in your situation. So my take is that what we have been doing so far in this new normal is not what we call professional development, right? What we have been doing is solving the problems of practice. And we are learning how to solve problems of practice for this context, but not necessarily for a reality which is going to be very different once we go back into the classroom. We are in Uruguay going back into the classroom. Um, for you to have an idea, we the way we're doing it is on a voluntary basis. So teachers can volunteer to teach on site and students can volunteer to attend. But we also have to take care of the students who don't want to attend and of the teachers who don't want to teach on site. Now, if you go on site, for example, in the college where I work, which is a four-year college, this week, the students who are in the last year started. Next week, we are going to have the students who are in the third year of their career, but only the third years, because we needed the space to be able to, be, to implement social distancing. Then the week of August the 3rd, the students who are in second are going to go to class, but the fourth years and third years are going to be learning online again. And then, because we have many students in first grade, the first year of college, there are going, some of them are going to go one week and some others the following week. So that means that I won't be able to see my students face to face for five weeks until five weeks after the last time I taught them. I'll see them like this. All this brings challenges to us that we have to solve through what we might call professional development, because after all, we are trying to learn as well as our students. And this is a beautiful thing, because we've been talking, uh, those of us engaged with um, distance learning and, and technology-mediated instruction, a lot about the Vygotskian perspective, where the teacher is the learner at the same time as the learners who are the teachers. Um, boy, was Vygotsky right. I've learned so much more from my students than I could have possibly taught them. And the problem is that in general, right, in general, I'm generalizing here, we don't have much support. 
a lot depends on who you are working for and who you're working with. I'm very proud of my country for many, many reasons. But one of the things that made me the proudest this year was that when this crisis hit us, all of a sudden, all the educational levels came together. So we would volunteer our time to do free webinars to share things that were actually working in our classrooms. And teachers had access to those things through a dedicated to YouTube channel. We used our own uh, accounts for technology. So we would do 40 minutes, then take a five minute break for a cup of coffee, come back and do another 40 minutes. But the whole community came together, which is not necessarily what happened in other places in the world. So we do have some generous contributions from colleagues. And <clears throat> what we have tended to do, at least I have watched a lot of webinars like you guys are doing now. A lot of webinars, many times with conflicting messages. There's a lot online. And um, I see in many webinars the same problem that I see with material downloaded from the internet. It's not curated. Anybody who has a camera and a computer and wants to say something can create their own YouTube channel and teach a webinar and give advice to teachers. Many times, things that I've seen, and we have actually done this with a group of critical friends that I belong to, is looking at these webinars that uh, my colleagues are watching and swearing by. And what we see is an effort to try and show teachers how to do the same things where they were doing in the classroom, face to face, but online. And there's a whole different logic to teaching online, which is not the same thing as teaching face to face. So, <clears throat> One of the other things that comes with it is the proliferation of applications. Now, uh, in this time and age, technology is a commodity. It's a marketable good. And developers of applications, of course, they all peddle their business. I think we are in um, a peak of applications development. But then when we look at the applications and we see what they leave behind. Can we honestly say that they leave some learning or are they just a good excuse to keep students motivated or engaged? If that is so, and if they claim to keep students engaged and motivating, all the better for them. But if they claim to make your classes meaningful and magically turn your teaching into learning, and they are not based on sound pedagogical principles, then that doesn't happen. What we are doing is learning new ways of keeping students focused through technology. That is what we teachers have been doing. Not because of the apps, not because of the webinars, but because we need, it's our uh, ethical mandate to try and find opportunities for the students to receive the same kind of teaching. And you know whose shoulders that lies on? Yours and mine. And then <clears throat> we still have ma classroom management issues to cope. Very famous one, fighting with the students for them to switch on their camera. My class is at 8 o'clock in the morning. I decided that I would start it at 8.30 instead of 8 o'clock because, uh, in general, people were asleep at 8 o'clock. And I sat there waiting, and the waiting room was inhabited by yours truly alone, right? 8.15, they started coming, so I said, okay, 8.30. Guess what? Now it's 8.30, and I'm still biding my time waiting for them to come. And these are young adults. Right, So we still have the same kind of classroom management issues to cope with. And the truth is we are working so much more than face-to-face -face that sometimes we cannot take it anymore. It's too much. 
So we do need professional development at this stage, but professional development that is tailored to our needs. And this is the call that I want to make to you all, right? Two years ago, Silvana Richardson and myself wrote a white paper for Cambridge, Cambridge ELT papers on professional development. This is free download, is freely downloadable from the Cambridge uh, site. Uh, you just Google my name or Silvanus, right? And there we came up with an acronym that somehow summarizes what we feel that professional development should do. Professional development should inspire us. How does that work? Well, based, first of all, we have to have evidence-informed CPD. We cannot just jump on any bad wagon that is not supported by evidence. And I mean, evidence is in the form of research, but also what we hear works for our colleagues. After all, CPD programs, when I mean a, a, a program of continuous professional development, these programs require a significant investment of time on the part of the teacher, resources on the part of the school or ministries of education, but more importantly, they need a commitment from everyone involved. And that everyone includes the parents, the students, the teachers, the school administrators, or the Ministry of Education. If one of those is not committed to teachers' growth, then growth is not possible. Another thing that we learn from evidence-informed CPD is that not all CPD initiatives are effective. And by the same token, not all CPD materials are reliable. So where do we turn to if we cannot turn to the web, for example? Well, the first thing you have to think about is what types of CPD initiatives result in better learning, not just for the students, but also for their teachers nowadays? And I think that the best kind of learning that can happen is learning that helps our teachers go through this pandemic and come out of it strengthened and even in one piece. Because I'm seeing how much of a toll this whole situation is taking on our colleagues and even on myself. So I'm worried about our health above and beyond the virus. Just the work can really uh, affect us. So as I said, <clears throat> back in 2005, Andy Hargrave said, that what we want for our students, we should want for our teachers. And what do we want for our students? Learning, challenge, support, and respect. So this is my quest, to tell people about good professional development, to give you tools for you to select what is really worth selecting, and not just something that puts like a Band-Aid band -aid on a big wound. With Silvana, we talked about this inspire professional development. And good professional development has an impact, an impact that can be readily seen. Impactful in the sense that it impacts the teaching that is going on. There's something new. There's something different from the old times. And it impacts also the learning that students are, uh, are going through. <clears throat> Just this morning, I was discussing with my student teachers, the student teachers I, I work with, the difficulty that they are having now that they are meeting the students face-to-face -to, -face to get the students to actually participate in class and talk. Students are kind of afraid. And then we came to the realization that actually most of these students because of different issues, connectivity, lack of teachers. They hadn't seen English for the past eight months. We finished courses in November last year. And now they're coming back to the classroom at the end of July. So they haven't actually heard English for learning in a school for eight months. 
So they tend to revert to their original shyness, avoidance of participation, and they have a strongly held belief that when the teacher speaks to them in English, maybe they don't understand. But they do understand much more than... Um, than uh, they can actually produce. And the fact that we've had all these pressures, and I know, um, I don't know if this has been the case in your countries, but when parents start complaining so much that they wanted the teachers on the screen, on the screen, on the screen, many times teachers ended up going back to a very transmissive form of teaching, right? So as to be able to cover things, to cover the syllabus, or to just keep the students engaged and happy, right? There has been a lot of explaining, of telling, and not so much interacting. Besides impactful, good professional development is based on the needs of the teachers. So everything and anything which is available will not be equally suitable for all our colleagues. Each of us has a different learning need in this uh, pandemic. We each need uh, not just um, tools in the good sense of the word, right? Not just tools, but also inspiration, ideas. We need access to how other colleagues are learning so that we can somehow learn from those experiences as well. And saying that professional development has needs has to be needs based does not mean that it has to do with the technology. Many schools said, "Okay, now I'm going to give you courses on how to use a certain uh, video conferencing software or how to upload work to a learning management system." And that is not necessarily what teachers might have needed, which was how do I connect to my students? How do I establish the personal connection? How do I make technology transparent so that neither the students nor I feel that we are away? How do we feel we are close? Third thing, it has to be good professional development. The one that is really effective is sustained. What do we mean by sustained? It's sustained over time because professional development is a process, but it's also sustained because there are coaches or mentors or colleagues who help you. Now, we have all been to the course, typical course. We've all watched the webinar. Now, when I go into the classroom and try, try to implement it myself, in general, I feel that, okay, am I doing this right? We are very tentative. However, if we had a coach, somebody who could be part of our class and give us peer coaching, for example, that would be wonderful, right? And then that couldn't just be once. It should be like a bond, a relationship that forms over time and is sustained over time. You cannot find that in a webinar. You cannot find that... In, in an application, that is human contact. And I'm going to come back to that. The other thing is we know that good, effective professional development is peer collaborative. We learn from our peers. You know, uh, when you read the evaluations of many conferences, uh, one typical question is, what did you like the most about the conference? And without a doubt, the great majority of teachers will answer the chance to be with my peers, to share ideas with my colleagues, to talk to my colleagues. And that is true because we, we are a gregarious profession. We are a social profession. We need that social contact. Now, we know that good, effective professional development is not theoretical. You can read as many articles from research, methodology books as you want, but un unless you put it into practice and you learn to unlearn what you used to do wrong, then professional development is not going to uh, create the effects that we wish uh, it to create. And it has to be reflective. Teachers need to think through what they are doing.
And for that, you need time. We have reflection on action, yes. Uh, reflection in action, sorry. That's when we are in the interactive phase of teaching and you have to make a decision. You cannot say, okay, students, stop. Wait a minute, I'm going to reflect. No, we make decisions. Actually, a teacher makes a thousand different decisions on an average day. But when we reflect on our actions, when we reflect on, is this promoting the learning that I want my students to receive? Is this good for my students? That level of reflection requires time. And I was reading one of those Facebook entries that are circulating, and I think it was from a Chilean teacher who tells us about her day, how it starts at seven o'clock in the morning and how she sneaks out of class for half an hour at noon to prepare some food and to eat with her husband and children. But then she's back on the computer until something like eight or nine where she sneaks out another half an hour. And then she goes back to the computer to grade mark respond uh, uh, emails, right? When can we reflect? Well, we need more than ever now, demand the time to be able to engage in those things. And last but not least, good effective professional development needs to be evaluated. We need to be able to look back and say, this has worked, this hasn't worked. The way I see it, if we look at it as it's being generally done, or at least these are the stories that I have heard and the experiences that I have had. If we look at all these uh, conditions or criteria for good professional development, can the current professional development pass the test? Let's see impactful. It has impacted the teacher's teaching, so teachers can teach better, and it has impacted students' learning. Well, it's too soon to tell. So that's a big question mark. It may, may not. Needs-based. <clears throat> I have to say that most of the professional development my colleagues and I have engaged in has been based on needs. Right, uh, because we I didn't know how to use something very simple, like you are live on a video conference, and one student sends you a WhatsApp message like, teacher, what was the link? I cannot find it. How do you pass the link to the student? I didn't know how to do that. My students had to teach me, right? So it is needs-based. But not always. The possibility remains that it's not based on teachers' needs because if your institution has decided, okay, we're going to have this course, you do this online course on top of everything you have to do, right? And you learn how to use the platforms. That's not necessarily professional development. I can learn about the platforms by watching a tutorial online, right? I can manage it. Sustained. We know it hasn't been sustained because we are alone. Something that we have criticized so much in education, the fact that teachers can close their classroom door and do whatever they want. And we know that that isolation has conspired against quality of teaching and quality of learning. Well, now guess what? We are confined to our own tiny little space. Peer collaborative. <clears throat> In my experience, not much peer collaboration. Collaboration as such, right? There has been peer exchange, which is not the same thing. Oh, you're doing it this way, yeah. Oh, what a cool app. And then we trade things, but not collaboration. Like, have you been able to sit down, plan together? Have you invited your colleagues over to your Zoom meetings and participated in your colleagues' Zoom meetings? Can you, have you invited your colleagues to be guest speakers in your class, right? Because after all, you could be a guest, a guest speaker in their classes, and in that way that you could increase uh, interaction. In practice, yes, we have to say that everything we are learning, <coughs> pardon me, 
this is not COVID, this is smoking. Um, everything that we do has a ready practical application, but, and there's a but, that application is a spare of the moment thing. I've seen these things happen on site and online. We, we learn about a new thing and then everybody starts using it. I remember when Kahoot had just come out and I was working in an institution, a higher education institution. And of course, I was managing the professional development center of that institution. One of the workshops that we gave was on using Kahoot for formative assessment. And then at the end of that semester, <laughs> when we were reading student evaluations of the teachers, students were saying, please, no more Kahoot. So we had saturated the field with that. Reflective, I I'm not going to say no. I'm tempted to say no, but I'm not going to say no. I'm going to put a question mark uh, because maybe just by engaging in this kind of activity that we are now doing, right we can access some level of reflection right we can open up a window to saying am i doing this right i always tell my students there's a wonderful quote by paulo freire right, where he says uh, something along the lines of when a teacher is doing something a teacher should always think who am i doing this for and who am i doing this against and I encourage my students to take the social justice perspective in their teaching. They create an activity, a task, a handout. Okay, let's think in terms of your students. Who is this for? And who does this conspire against? Right? And last but not least, I can very well say that this professional development, the one we are currently having, is not evaluated. And it's not going to be evaluated. So... If I were to run the Lismus test of current professional development, unfortunately, I would have to say, no, it doesn't pass the test, okay? So how can we best prepare ourselves for a future which is uncertain, very uncertain? Well, <clears throat> I would like you to fill in the blanks. Could you please read and just think what words could go in the blanks. Read this little opinion piece while I take some water. Okay. Have you used the word continued professional development? Hopefully you have. It is my contention that when you, as a teacher, go to many school administrators and say, we want to do this course, we want to run this workshop, we want paid time to coordinate, to plan together, what you are doing is you are giving an investment to the school. You're making an investment in the school. But many administrators see it as an expense. Boy. Are they sorry now? Have they given you the tools, the time, and the money? And it doesn't have to be a lot, right? To learn how to use technology more, would the situation be different? And if it is my contention that many private schools have remained open because of you guys, because of the teachers who have gone the extra mile, use their own resources, and we know we've paid for our own technology. We've bought licenses on our credit cards in 12 installments, borrowing credit cards, international credit cards from friends. And we bought our own technology. So <clears throat> what would I recommend as best practices in this future? First of all, that this has to be acknowledged. Uh, school systems, Ministers of Education, school administrators need to learn that continuous professional development of teachers is an investment in the future and not an expense. And it should be part of our daily lives. There's no reason why we have to give up our own free time 
to learn more about our profession when other professions have dedicated time for their own growth, right? So <clears throat> I would say that if we want good professional development that is future-oriented, whatever we can do now, but thinking about the future, we have to start with what teachers really want and need. And I think one big IOU is focus on online pedagogy, not online technology. It's enough with the technology. Let's think about how people learn, and so how should we teach online. Secondly, don't use experts. Use expert teachers. Your own people, the people inside the school who are teaching the students and who are developing all this knowledge, that where does it remain? Inside the teacher, the individual teachers, because we are not given time to share. <clears throat> Make that professional development sustain, not one off, uh, one off workshop or webinar or course, and not just on technology. Yeah, it's okay. If your school or your Ministry of Education are going to use a certain technology, you need to get uh, uh, trained for, for using it. Also, there is, uh, with Silvana, we created this idea that there are two kinds of professional development. There's mandatory professional development, and that is in line with the institutional needs, but there's also choice professional development. Provide coaching and mentoring. Use active methods for training each other. Foster the development of communities of practice, groups of people who come together for the same purpose. And communities don't have to be permanent. They can be ad hoc, created for a specific purpose, and then disbanded. <coughs> and use blended learning. We teachers, we need the human contact. <coughs> Pardon me. So for what do we need to do? We need to seek teachers and institutions or ministries of education have to offer flexible funding. In short, for CPD programs to achieve impact, they need to have a direct application to teachers' daily lives. Because guess what? It's the teachers who are keeping the institutions afloat. Three important Cs, communication, chunking, and community. Communication. Tell teachers exactly, uh, look for ways for teachers to tell you exactly what their expectations are. Uh, communicate expectations before, during, and after. In chunking, I mean, do it in bites, in bits, and you blend synchronous and asynchronous, asynchronous professional learning strategies. And uh, one thing that you can do is start every session with a check in. Uh, that it could be professional or personal. This is just an idea. Today, I wanted to do one, but because of the technology, we couldn't, which is like, where would you be if you weren't in this? Uh, where would you rather be if you weren't in this webinar, right? Building the human connection, is that is what builds community, right? So re do you remember a traveler who was leaving the town and people wanted to buy the stone, but... He said no and left. Look at this. He was leaving the town. The stranger came upon a group of village children standing near the road. He gave the silken bag containing the stone to the youngest child, whispering in his ear, it was not the stone, but the villagers that have performed the magic. Now we can create magic, and we have magic to do. But that magic will only happen if our colleagues are all part of it, if the villagers come together. So I want to thank you very much for attending the webinar. Uh, Renata. Hi, I'm back here. You are back? Let me yeah, see you. Before the questions, I have a few things to say to you, Gabriel. Yeah. Uh, crystal clear view. I I'm his number one fan. I love. These are all a uh, few quotes I took it from our uh, chat. People were very excited about your webinar. I thank you. I'm glad. I'm very glad that you quoted uh, Paulo Freire. 
I of have course. to say. <laughs> of course. And I love the fact that just that you mentioned the power of the teacher because I do believe in the same thing as you. Now, shall we start with the questions? Absolutely. Maria Thank Clark. You. Okay, you you'll read them. Yeah, I read it. Maria Clarfeld from Buenos Aires, Argentina asks, "What you would you recommend for reflection and self assessment as regards oh, professional develop, development?" Um, something very tried and tested, which is keeping a professional development diary. And you don't need to buy a special notebook, although some people like special notebooks. I just have it. You know the post-it notes that uh, you can put on your computer. Every day I force myself to do what Queen Victoria used to do. Every day she sat nice. down and wrote in her diary, right? Yeah. I'm a history buff, sorry. <laughs> and I just write a reaction from the day. And you say like, well, but is that reflection? No, because what happens is every so often, I go back over my reactions of the day, and that sets my reflection in motion. And I try to share it. I never keep it to myself. I'm very fortunate to be surrounded by amazing colleagues who are a sounding board. But again, when I was discussing with them what I was going to do in the webinar today, we were saying uh, this group did not happen just because. It was not spontaneous generation. There is investment of everybody, right? We all wanted to share this experience. Thank you very much. Our Maria. next question is from Rafael Soares. How to filter and select the best webinars, courses, lectures for our development when there is such a huge amount on the same topic being offered nowadays? Well, again, it's going back to the community. I'm very selective, right? And whenever I uh, sign up for a webinar, I, I ask for a description of what is it going to be about, right? If you're going to tell me five techniques that I am using in my face-to-face -face classes, how to put them online, no, sorry, this is not for me. I ask, I write to the organizers and say, could you just explain to me briefly what the webinar is going to be about? And I think there's nothing wrong with that. Some people have taken offense. It's like, well, if you want to attend, sign up. I mean, I'm not trying to, I'm just, I'm a learner, right? Could you tell me what I'm going to, what I'm going to be learning, right? And yes, it's true. Word of mouth is great. I have seen amazing webinars that were completely off my radar because a colleague mentioned, you don't know what I saw the other day, right? I love that one. Our next question comes from Buenos Aires, Maria Clarford. Uh, which is the best teacher well-being strategy that has worked with you, Mr. Diaz? Okay, Maria. Um, I have to confess I'm a workaholic person. Uh, I, For example, today I've been up since 2 o'clock in the morning because my students were submitting their papers today and I had to give them feedback today because the final submission is next week. And I, I have a very busy... Uh, so my well-being... Uh, it's very personal. It's spending time with my children, doing some amazing cooking. I'm a great cook. Uh, and spending time with my family and friends. That's all I do. Uh, every Sunday, for example, uh, I, you know, through Facebook, we have all reconnected with our high school friends. So every Sunday, we drink mate together for half an hour only with my high school friends. That's my well-being, my switching off. But other than that, I work a lot. I enjoy this. I enjoy my work and I enjoy being with students. So that is my well-being. Thank you very much. Our next question, Monica Beatriz Ziegler for Lomas de Zamora, Argentina. Will teachers be able to profit from affordable online CPD after COVID-19? Well, it's all a matter of um, uh, offer and demand, okay? I think that if I mean, I'm looking at this, 120 colleagues, and I haven't been doing webinars uh, uh, this past four months for 150, 200, 300. So there will be a lot of free stuff. So providers of online professional development will have to lower their prices otherwise because there's so much out there, right? Or that one would hope. 
And it's only logical that I know that people can charge for their services because after all, uh, there's the selfless giving to the profession and to the colleagues, but also putting together a webinar takes you a long time, right? And making sure that you're sending the right message, is rehearsing, is showing your slides to other people to see is this clear, will they, what questions may come up. So there is something that has to be paid, right, for services, but not the outrageous uh, prices that some people charge, like $100 for a two-day event. Catarina uh, Guauda asks, could you say something more, uh, could you say something, sorry, about the relationship between professional development, contemporary era, which means, among others, the advent of technology and student issues? Do you have 10 hours for this? <laughs> I think this is actually another webinar. <laughs> it's, it's actually another series of webinars. So many things to do. Um, I The only thing that I could say is that we need more than ever to be more proactive than reactive. We need to look at what our students' needs are, and we need to try and cater for those. Right. I had a very set in his ways student who hates online teaching, hates technology. And it was very hard for me to find that je ne sais quoi to bring that person on board. And you know how I found it? We speak on the phone personally once a week. And then he comes to class. Right. Yeah, and he was, I mean, because he's going to be a teacher and he will have to teach. So, yeah, um, and there are a lot of issues that we ha that haven't been discussed yet. What is happening from the student's end? I see a lot of people who send me, we're doing research on teachers' perceptions and teachers' perceptions of administrator support, but where is the voice of the student in the research? Who is asking the students, what is going on with you? It's us, the teachers, and we are unfortunately unable to communicate that. So for the researchers out there, something for you to think of. Next question, Claudia Oliveira from Altamira, Pará. I had to adapt to remote teaching overnight with no training. I often felt pressure to do the job and get results. How can we deal with emotions? That's a very important uh, OK, question. you see, this is a typical case. Right, where we see the imposter syndrome coming up, we all had were thrown in, thrown in at the deep end. The way I'm managing my emotions is I'm all the time asking my students, is this working for you? And if it doesn't work, well, how can I do it better? Right? I have a standard Google form. And I, the students can go in as many times as they want and just leave suggestions, and that's completely anonymous. So I read that every now and then, and I try to adapt that. And I've had amazing rewards, right? Like one of the classes that I thought was like, oh, okay, this is me going to go into uh, Zoom and then putting them in, in breakout rooms, and then, yeah, I'm going to ask them to do a little role play, and then we are going to practice some teaching skill. To me, it was like, eh, a meh lesson. They were like, it was amazing, it was great. And so I immediately, I tweeted it. I tweeted it because I tweet my students' comments. And I went to each one of them and said, okay, what was special about this lesson? And then I tried to replicate, not every single lesson, but I tried to put some element in the different lessons that I teach of that. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Any final words, any final thoughts? And what's your Twitter address? Because I want to follow you. <laughs> okay. Um, you can follow me, Gabriel Diaz Maggioli, on Facebook. Uh, and then there you can have my Twitter handle and also, well, Instagram. You see, that's my professional development. I need to use Instagram. I hadn't used it until one of my sons went on a trip. And he would post things on Instagram only. So if I wanted to know how he was, I had to look at Instagram. But it's not something that I, I really, really like. 
Um, Final words for our teachers that are here saying that you are so down to work. I wish I were his colleague and things like that. <laughs> well, I define myself as a teacher and I have never left, uh, abandoned being a teacher and thinking like a teacher and feeling like a teacher. So I hope, I only hope, and as I said, that I can give back to the community what the community has given me so much. Oh, a kitten. My cats, they can, they see that I'm live and they, they come here over the table. <laughs> okay. But thank you oh very God. much, Gabriel. Thank you for the invitation and everybody, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> if I can put up my, sure. you have my email there. Oh, one thing I forgot to tell you is the image credits. All the images are uh, paid uh, images on depositphotos.com, right? Okay, Renata, thank you Good very night much. on your tiny jewel in Uruguay. Thank you very much, Gabriel. And thank you who are here with us until the end of this day. Once we reach the middle of our journey, there's no point of return. So we must go on to the end and discover a treasure Cambridge University Press has planned for you. Oops, I've already said too much. So let's get back to our script. Don't forget to take our survey. Your opinion about Cambridge Day 2020 is very important to us. After answering all survey questions, you'll be able to download your certificate of participation. This certificate is editable. You can put your name on it. Also remember to donate for Food for Thought, Cambridge Day project that donate food to a local NGO every year. This year, we are working with Assam Pela Cidadania that since 1993 fights against hunger and poverty in Brazil. I'm waiting for you tomorrow on day four of Cambridge Day. And here it is, the video with the lineup. Cheers and bye-bye. Have a great night.